It is somewhat of a rare occurrence for us to hear on the uh, Big Impact to have a guest on more than once, but that's exactly what we're doing today because it was a couple years ago that we introduced you to a photojournalist, now turned author by the name of Ted Jackson, and when we first connected, I learned the story, the incredible story of his search for Jackie Wallace. Well, Ted has turned that story um, in, and his experience in, in all of this into a book called You Ought to Do a Story About Me. And with that, I say hello, Ted, and welcome back. It's good to see you. Oh, thank you. It is great to be back. Great to talk to you. Well, I, when I first stumbled across this story a couple of years ago, I think it was on social media. Someone had a link that said you might want to read this, and so I did. And I was, I was so enthralled by the journey of yourself and Jackie Wallace that uh, when this book came out, I reached out to your folks at, uh, at William & Morrow and just said, I, I got I to talk to him again because uh, there's so much compelling content in this journey. So if you don't mind, let's first, let's back the truck up a little bit for those who weren't paying attention a couple of years ago or perhaps have forgotten um, how you were first introduced to Jackie Wallace and maybe we should start with who Jackie Wallace is. Well, I'll, I'll uh, start it the way, in the exact way that I discovered who Jackie Wallace was. Uh, so um, back in 1990, which is now 30 years ago, uh, my math is, is good enough to do the basics like that, but I was given a, a basic assignment to, um, to go down to a, a homeless camp. And um, when, I, when I got there under a bridge in New Orleans, um, the camp was no longer active. And so I was headed back to my car and I basically stumbled over a homeless man who was sleeping on a rusty box spring. And his camp was unique looking. Um, it was so neat and organized and tidy and tucked away in the weeds. And um, so I climbed up on a, the bridge there and made one single frame and um, climbed down and woke the man up to ask him what had happened to the camp. I really had no intention of using the picture. It was just a unique looking picture. But um, he told me what had happened to the camp and, and then he asked me why I wanted to know and I told him I was with the Times Speaking Union newspaper. And he kind of looked at the, he had a newspaper folded next to his bed. He kind of looked at it and then looked at me and said, you ought to do a story about me. And I said, why? You know, cause I hear that all, all the time. Hey, mister, take my picture, put me in the paper. But he said, because I've played in three Super Bowls. And I didn't know what to think. I didn't uh, know what to believe at that moment. Uh, I asked him for his name. He told me Jackie Wallace. And it meant nothing to me because I, I followed sports. I really was a big fan, football fan. But I had um, not the kind of fan that follows rosters like that and remembers names. Um, so I went back to the newspaper office and I asked it, the, the sports editor if he knew who Jackie Wallace was. And uh, every head in the sports department, which at that time was about 30, 35 people in the sports department, now it's about two. Their heads popped up. Yeah, it's about two. And uh, they, they popped their heads up and they proceeded to tell me who he was, that he had been a, a legend at the St. Aug High School in the city and went to play at Arizona, was an All-American, drafted by the Vikings, and then was, played for the Colts and then the Rams and played in two Super Bowls, not the three that he had told me, but that was because he was on the team, but he didn't actually get in the game that first year but um then they told me that nobody knew where he was anymore and so that's when I knew I had a story and uh that's where it started and it all started on a photo assignment uh, just to be clear for our listeners you were sent down to capture some visuals you you were not a writer you were you were probably armed with multiple lenses and cameras at that time exactly I I had done uh, I, I may have written a few little essays uh, for the paper, but had never written a story. And I didn't write that story that day. Uh, the sports writer 
uh, Jimmy Smith wrote the uh, the story of of us finding him that day, and and uh, it made a huge impact. Um, his former teammates from St. Aug came and got him from under the bridge and sent him to a rehab clinic in Baltimore. Well, that's one of the aspects of the first round or the first chapter of this story that I remember right. is that after you discovered right. him, uh, it, it alerted a lot of people as to his survival and his uh, location so that they could come along and do something to try to help this guy that they, that they all loved. They just had simply lost track of. And in the, in the case of Jackie Wallace, if I remember correctly, he didn't really want to be found at first. That's right. He had um, fallen on hard times, and um, when he when he left um, football, when he basically got um, blackballed out of out of football, um, he did okay for a while, and he got a job in the oil oil patch, and and uh, was actually making more money there than he was in the NFL. Uh, but then his mother died, and um, that really threw him for a loop. And uh, so he was about 33 years old at that time, had never been uh, involved with drugs uh, and abusing, um, you know, substances like that. And, and uh, but that, that destroyed him at that moment. And at that point that he, he just did not want to be found. He, he wanted to be under the bridge. He wanted to be left alone. And, um, but something made him tell me that day that uh, you ought to do a story about me. And the, the ironic thing is the newspaper that was folded neatly, and you can see it in the photo that I shot that day, um, that the paper was folded to the story that Jimmy Smith was writing. It was the third of a three-part series called basically uh, NFL Stars, Where Are They Today? And it was about Joe Ehrman, who was, you know, played for uh, the Baltimore Colts in 76, was one of Jackie's teammates. And I didn't realize that for a while, but uh, I'm sure he went to sleep that day uh, looking at that newspaper article. It was folded out to that story, and he probably thought, well, maybe someone would be interested in doing a story about me. And then he wakes up with me over, standing over him. Well, um, there's something to that scene and something to that experience for you that stuck with you. It would have been pretty simple for you to go out, take the photo that you were assigned to take, come back in, uh, mention the name of Jackie Wallace, see all the heads in the sports department turn and recognize, and then you could have been done with it um, and, and never really thought about it again. But something about that encounter grabbed hold of you back then, and it obviously it has stayed with you to lead you to, to write this book. What grabbed you? Well, it's, it's interesting that at the time, I felt like it was a job well done for the day, just like you described. And I collected a few clips of the, the front page story and put it under my desk and, and then moved on to the next thing. It was, uh, my career was, uh, was really, really uh, accelerating at that time. I was starting to travel a lot overseas. What, what but, year um, did you take the picture, by the way? 1990. Okay. Yeah, it was, uh, that picture was taken July the 3rd, 1990, because it was the oh, day before the 4th of July. We are, we are definitely on a multi-decade journey that's, here. That's right. But what, what started the change was three years later, when I was sitting at my desk, typing captions for another assignment. And um, the photo department is separated from the newsroom by a big plate glass window. And... Um, there was a tap on the window, pop, 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 you know, kind of a tap. And I, I looked up and there standing before me, looming over me was six foot three Jackie Wallace in a three piece suit with his arms stretched out as far as he could and his, his grin from ear to ear. And he said, do you believe in miracles? <laughs> <laughs> what in the world brought him into uh, the newsroom? He had gotten cleaned and straightened out in Baltimore. He had met a woman. They had uh, gotten engaged, and he had charmed his way into the newsroom back in New Orleans to invite me and uh, and Jimmy to his wedding in Baltimore. And um, and uh, that's when it changed. That's when Jackie began um, um, kind of 
morphing from a subject of a soap of, of a photo to a friend at that mm. point. And, um, but the story that was starting to develop was what led to the book eventually 30 years later that just has the ups and downs and roller coaster rides and every lesson that you want to learn in the in the in the world is crammed in the this story of Jackie Wallace and yeah it it is and in fact had disney written the script the the credits start to roll probably when he's standing in the newsroom with his arms open to give you a big hug and the friendship begins and the two of you ride off into the sunset and go watch a game together uh, that's not why we're talking today. Uh, no, it's the not. Story of, the story of, of Ted Jackson and Jackie Wallace is not the blind side. It doesn't end quite as cleanly as the Sandra Bullock version. So you have this meeting. He's clean and sober. He's smiling. He's, he's glad that you're part of his life. But I seem to recall that, that he, he's, he's gone again pretty soon, like disappeared again, right? Well, this is this is where the story begins instead yeah. of ending. It, it's a uh, now Jackie was um, we got to go visit Jackie in Baltimore and see where he worked and his new home. It was a beautiful house, and um, uh, but that's that's where it became a friendship. And Jackie would call me every Thanksgiving morning to wish me happy Thanksgiving and to to say what a wonderful thing it was for us to meet. And uh, but he was clean and sober for at least eight years at that point. And when he um, when the when the phone call stopped coming on Thanksgiving, that's when I knew something probably was wrong. And but it it took two years of those phone calls not coming to realize that something had happened. You know, you know, figured things he moved on, and changed his you know his habits of Thanksgiving. But when we um, we made a phone call and, and found out that he was missing again. Um, that's, that led to a different story. And it, um, it, it led to another 12 years of Jackie being missing on the street. And what led to the book was the fact that he was gone for so long that I, it haunted me. And, um, you know, I just wondered what had happened to him? Where, where did he go? Uh, was he dead? Was he in prison? Was he still under a bridge that was just within arm's reach? Um, I was more curious, but it, it, it haunted me not knowing. And that's when I went out on a search to try to find him. And um, that's, um, that, and, and that's kind of the story of the relationship is, 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 is the 30 years of trying to help him. And at the same time, to my surprise, he helps me. Our guest here on The Big Impact is a photojournalist and author, Ted Jackson. His book is called You Ought to Do, A Story About Me. And it's his journey with Jackie Wallace, a two-time a Super Bowl participant, three-time Super Bowl team member, went homeless and dealt with all sorts of issues, went missing for a long time. You mentioned right before the break, Ted, that he went missing for 12 years. Now, a lot of people who are kind of friends, but maybe not, you know, not closer than a brother friend, come year seven or eight, we might even have lost thought of, certainly lost track of, and lost the, maybe the, the drive to keep track of someone who has uh, obviously chosen to go missing. Why do you think, why do you think you didn't let it go? Well, like I talk about in the book, there's a, there's, a, there's a moment in time where, you know, as a photojournalist, we have all kinds of crazy assignments. And, and that's what I love about the job was that you've, I've, I've always found myself in ridiculously interesting places. And one night, a reporter and I um, had a, a, a project where we were going to spend the night at a homeless shelter so that we could really understand of uh, what the homeless men were complaining about at this shelter. And um, that night, as I lay in my bunk with my cameras, you know, tucked up under my pillow to keep them from getting stolen, um, I realized that all evening I'd been looking for Jackie and trying to find him in the, in the 12 year old older faces. And, and, 
and I realized that now no one even recognized the name anymore. And uh, it bothered me so much that uh, I decided right then and there that I was going to make a dedicated effort to do that, to find him. And uh, well, it wasn't well, while you were in the in the shelter, by the way, kind of doing field research. What did you observe, and what did you learn about poverty in general? I have. Um, I'll I'll just throw this in here uh, away from. This program, I work with a number of homeless shelters around the country as a consultant, a communications and fundraising consultant. And um, I, I think every single time I go to a rescue mission, I learn something new. Um, and, and I'd like to think that, I've because I've been doing it for over 20 years, I'd like to think that maybe I've, I've come to, to understand everything. But that's not the case, especially with the changing face of homelessness now involving more families or more fathers with children. It used to be thought of as only moms with children and just so many different aspects that lead to this situation of poverty that nobody ever dreamed that they would need this kind of help, that they would have to stand at the front door uh, or at the front desk and say, can I stay here tonight? They didn't want to do that. And so it still grabs hold of me every time I meet someone in that situation what did you learn? As you, I've not slept in the dorm. I've not had to hide my cameras under the pillow. So you, you had a little bit more intense immersion into it. Right. And I've, I've worked on homeless stories for decades, but this one was unique. Um, I had never immersed myself like this before. And, and in order to stay the night, you know, we weren't undercover, but we wanted to do everything as if we were homeless walking in um and so i had to go through the regular intake and uh, they treated me like regular intake and um i th think that was the biggest eye opener was having to sit through a 30 45 minute interview uh to make sure that they knew everything about me and before they would let me in um that we'd have to bathe that we'd have to have a tv test we'd have to um, divulge everything. And I'm telling you, that was one of the most humbling things I've ever had to do mm -hmm. to, to answer those embarrassing questions. And then once, once I got past that, um, I, I found that, you know, the, the, the people that are there are usually not what you think. Um, they've, they've had problems, they have issues, they have uh, scars that they're trying to deal with. Some are addicted, some are mentally ill. Um, some are dumped there uh, at the shelter. One was um, uh, forced to come to the shelter um, as part of the agreement to, to be released from prison from Angola. Mm -hmm. And um, he was sent there and his intent was um, to stay the required amount of time and then he would um, leave there and um, go back to the swamps where he was raised and the woman who snitched on him and to kill her. That was his intent. And for, you know, in, in this story, um, the, the men were remarkably honest to me and told me all their personal stories. And, um, and another man who had um, walked in on his wife who was having an affair on him. And so he, in desperation, he went home and pulled out his rifle and tried to commit suicide. And um, as he told me, he failed obviously in his suicide, but as he told me, boy, that was one five minutes I wish I had back in my life. And so, you know, all these stories that they, they, they tell um, really uh, opened my eyes to a different perspective. Um, uh, a lot of hard luck stories, but a lot of mental illness also. One elderly man, I think he was in his 80s, had um, his family had finally decided they couldn't take care of him anymore and didn't want to be bothered with him. So they put him in the car, drove him to the shelter, and put him on the sidewalk and drove away. And that was the night I was there. And uh, so, you know, two men were assigned to be his caretakers, you know, uh, and they, they were homeless clients themselves. And so that was, that was their job to take care of him and put him to bed that night. And uh, I photographed them tucking him in, in the chapel. 
because there was no place for him to sleep that night. You know, it's just it's just really sad to watch um, people being thrown away like that, basically. And I think that Jackie ties in with all of this. Jackie was homeless uh, because of his addiction. And um, a lot of times the homelessness and the addictions that we see is simply based on people who don't have much to live for. And so they give up on themselves because other people have given up on them. Yeah, I, I found that uh, at the end of the burning of a lot of bridges can be a very lonely existence. And so in some cases, family members have said, you've worn out your welcome uh, or you've stolen from us, you've caused us harm and danger. Not, that's not always the case, but sometimes it is. And so here is that last plate, the, the end of the rope, the final straw, whatever silly analogy you want to throw in. And so here they are at the mission where, by the way, a pretty incredible staff who has seen and heard every story under the sun, even if they know that the details aren't exactly accurate that they're hearing, they're saying, come on in. Yeah. Tonight, tonight we've got a pew in the chapel for you because all the beds are full, but you can stay here, you can eat here, you can clean up here. And we're here to take care of you. And I really think that in our national storylines that are told from coast to coast, some of the most underappreciated heroes, now I'm, I'm not trying to detract from what nurses and teachers and firefighters do. I, I'm all for it. Great. First responders, thank you. I think some of the most underappreciated heroes in our nation today are caring for the homeless. Quite often, uh, Ted, as you saw firsthand, in situations where they aren't trained to deal with this level of mental illness when it exists, it's just, a, it's just an act of love, uh, oftentimes an exercise of their faith, and what they feel is a calling to serve those in need. And it's incredible to see it when it's in action. Right, it is. And like you just described, one of the hardest things about dealing with people who are addicted and homeless and, and have these kinds of issues and mental issues is that the relapses are so high. It's like two out of three will relapse. And, but but I, I was sitting with a chaplain at the New Orleans Mission um, one afternoon while I was doing research for the book. And I, was, I asked him to describe what addiction was like because if I'm going to write about it, I need to really understand what that, what it feels like. And I said, I've never been addicted to anything before. And he looked at me and he said, Oh, really? <laughs> I know where this and... is going. But, <laughs> not to interrupt you, but one of my old friends who is a rescue mission director in Dallas, Texas right now has long said, we all have addictions. Some of them are legal. That's right. Some of them are advertised and they try to hook you in. It's, it's perfectly socially acceptable. Yep. And yeah, try taking the try, coffee, try, uh, coffee away from a caffeine addict and see how, long, how well that goes for you. Exactly. And how many of us have been on diets and how many of us can't stay away from our smartphone for five minutes? Right. You know, all that sounds like a joke until you try to really internalize those feelings of what it means to stay away from the chocolate cake or to stay away from sugar or whatever it is. I mean, seriously, think about that yeah. and then apply that to someone like Jackie Wallace, who has to, you know, to, to fight off the demons that are clawing at his brain 24 hours a day. And if he can wake up in the morning and find the strength to fight them off for 12 hours until he goes back to sleep, then he's won the day. Now, just imagine fighting those off for, for eight years, every single day, as strong as that addiction is for him. Um, so I, I learned a lot in trying to, to watch him and try to help him and try to encourage him and, and know that when he fell off the wagon and just like me, when I try to put the cell phone away and I, I reached for it when I didn't want to, that that's okay. That's okay, Jackie. You messed up today. Tomorrow 
we're going to do it again. And again and again, we just, we're going to make it the next day. And um, we found that to be a remarkable uh, encouragement. And, um, and, and I found out so much from Jackie and that, uh, you know, I, I learned so much about my faith in God and what it meant for us to be friends yeah. and what it meant for, uh, for, for him to help me uh, understand the battles that I would fight every single day. And um, he's such a joyful man. And uh, he just makes you smile when you walk in the room. And he's just so thankful for everything you do for him. Um, it, was, it was a remarkable day when I took him his copy of the book. And uh, he, oh, Bill, I got I to gotta tell you, when I handed it to him, I, I, it was, it was uh, put in an envelope because I wanted him to kind of open it as a, a present, you know, to, I wanted it to be a moment. And instead of tearing into it, he held it to his chest and wrapped it with his arms and just hugged it. And I said, aren't you going to open it? And he said, I want to spend some time with God first. Hmm. And it was, um, it was remarkable. It was, it was, it was an awesome moment, but um, he's very pleased with it. It's, it was awesome when he called me and said, uh, you know, he said, I'm reading it slowly. I'm reading it slowly. I want to get every word of it. And when he called me back, he said, okay, I finished it last night. He said, I've got something to tell you. Now, this is the scariest thing for an author. Let me tell you. <laughs> hold, hold that thought for a second, Ted. Let me take our last break. We'll come back and get the button on that story. As we continue talking with Ted Jackson, the author of You Ought to Do a Story About Me. When we come back, we'll hear the story that, um, of the book presentation and the initial review by the subject of the book, Jackie Wallace, when the big impact continues. We are heading down the home stretch with Ted Jackson. And uh, right before the break, Ted, you had just given Jackie the book. Um, in fact, I, I wasn't sure as we are speaking, if Jackie was still alive, you know, you had mentioned he had gone missing for a long time. So I do want to hear how that reunion took place, but let's get back to his review of the book in which he is the central figure. Well, he called me up and that's the most terrifying thing that the, an author could say. I read your book and <laughs> <laughs> he said, you got it right. Now, now, please know that Jackie is no uh, hero. Jackie is not a man to be emulated. Jackie is a cautionary tale in a lot of different ways, uh, but he's remarkable in one specific way. Is when he is down, he doesn't let himself stay down. He fights his way and claws his way back because as the subtitle on the book reads, the you know, the endless quest for redemption. And that's who we all are. We're all trying to find that place in life where we, you know, forgive ourselves and, and uh, um, find God in our lives and find that place in our life that uh, um, where we want to be. And um, so when Jackie said, you got it right, that means that we were able to tell warts and all and he opened his life up to me, warts and all, didn't hide anything, and told a remarkable tale. And he was very pleased that we got it right. Where and how did you find the man after all those years of him going missing again? Well, um, the, the story that was in the newspaper three years ago ended with him disappearing again. And that was a shocker to the readers. It was a shocker to me because I had written the story for the newspaper and had wrapped it up in a bow, just like a Hallmark movie. And I went to deliver a photograph that I'd promised him. And when I knocked on the door, he was gone again after being clean for three years. And this was the moment that I was looking forward to was seeing him right before the story published in the newspaper. And um, when I went to my editor and I told him that, um, that he was missing again, my editor, Carolyn Fox, just looked at me with shocked eyes. And she said, just write it the way it happened. Just write it the way it happened. And it was a remarkable story. And it was, you know, believe it or not, to me, is, you know, that it's, it was the most read story in the history of the Times-Picayune and still is. 
Um, but he was missing when I started writing this book. And um, I sold it to HarperCollins, my publisher. I sold it to them as a proposal with no last chapter. That was remarkable for a publisher to believe in the story so much that they, they bought it without a last chapter. So I kept telling Jackie, I said, you're writing the last chapter right now, whatever it is, you're living it now. And um, so, um, so when he went missing after the newspaper story, it was about, oh, I don't, I don't remember how long it was, 10 weeks or so like. My wife and I were sitting on the couch, eating dinner, watching TV, and um, the phone, the text dinged on my phone, and I looked down, and it was a friend of Jackie's uh, texting me, said simply, Jackie has a new phone. He wants you to call him. And I <laughs> bolted out of my chair. I looked at Nancy and I said, it's Jackie. And I went running to the back porch, which is where I always take my important phone calls and called him. He answered immediately and he was, he had crashed and he had crashed for 10 weeks in a crack house. And mm. he was, he had, you know, he, I describe it in the book. I, I, I take as many paragraphs as, as I think is necessary to describe what that moment was like for him. Uh, what, what giving in to the temptation felt like in his brain and how he wakes up weeks later and wakes up and wakes up and, and finds the will to pick up a phone and call someone that will come help him. Hmm. And, um, I, I just, I just love the book because I just learned so much about life and about, uh, about this man that I've, I've learned to care so much about and, uh, and what he goes through and what he did go through. And, and, uh, the startling thing with me is, uh, from the, uh, people who are reading it, uh, they, they call me and, or text me or email me and, and they say things like, uh, I just never had any idea that that's what my dad went through or what my brother's going through. And they'll say things like, I'm going to give them a call today. Well, you know, Ted, one of the, I think, powerful lessons of what you've been sharing has to do with those who are close to an addict. The overwhelming sense of, of uh, aloneness reaches out to the family members as well as to the addict. The addict always thinks that he or she is alone and that there's nobody that cares about them, and so that's why they try to deaden that pain. I actually believe that the families feel alone, that there can't possibly be any other family that can relate to what we're going through. Right. And as, as you're describing, that's just not true. There are people who care. Maybe there's somebody listening to this program right now who has a loved one who is missing, who's addicted, and you don't know if you're ever going to see him again. Just know this, they're not alone and you're not alone. I actually, Ted, I don't believe a lot in coincidence or, or this nebulous thing called fate. I really believe that our creator, that the Lord Almighty orchestrates things that oftentimes they don't make any sense to us. And I've said a million times, I'm glad I'm not in charge of writing life's script because man, would I mangle it. Right. But when, when we allow ourselves to be used by the Lord to reach someone in need, it's almost an indescribable honor, a, a privilege to be put into those positions. And so here is, uh, by the way, uh, and we won't take all the time to dig into this, but here is a photojournalist, not necessarily a writer, Caucasian, in the middle of some difficult times with race relations, especially down in the deep South, when you're down in Louisiana, there's, there's some issues with barriers in there and there probably still are as there are everywhere. And the Lord says, I got an idea. How about I take this guy named Ted and how about I have him stumble across a gargantuan African American NFL player and have him remain friends for life. Ted, we can't write that script. No, and, we can't. And I'm we so can't. glad. I'm so glad that you have undertaken the effort to write the story, even though you didn't write the script. If that makes any sense. 
It's it's amazing. Jackie and I, one day we were sitting in my car at the lakefront and I was doing one of my, you know, Jackie had to, had to open his soul to me, for me to write this book. We had to interview for countless hours. And one day we're sitting there talking, he's telling his life story, you know, telling little details and he just pops it out. He says, Ted, I really think God gave me the, the skills to be a football player in the beginning so that I could meet you under the bridge that day. And I, my jaw dropped because I said, Jackie, you won't believe this, but I've been thinking the same thing. I've been thinking the same thing. God gave me the skills as an artist to begin with, who discovered a camera, who discovered journalism for the express purpose so I could meet you that day. And here we are today with what has resulted in our life story together in a book. I said, this book is, is our purpose. This is what we were put here for. And um, my wife and I laugh, you know, through this whole process, it's writing this book has been a, a real process for me because um, first of all, it didn't have an ending. Um, and so every day was a new adventure and trying to figure out where it was going to go. But we always laugh and think that, you know, looking back, it is easy to see God's work in your life. You can see the landmarks, you can see the crossroads and where he guided you, where he shuffled you, what opportunities he laid in front of you. And I like to look at it like God opens a door for you if you're paying attention. Mm -hmm. The door is open for you all the time. Are you watching and then are you noticing it? And then are you brave enough to walk through it? And I think Jackie was a, a door that was open that I had to be brave enough to walk through. But looking back on those crossroads and landmarks, it's easy to see. But yet still, I worry that he won't be able to take care of me tomorrow. You know what I mean? I do. We all, we all anybody right. who tries, anybody who strives to walk a life of faith that is pleasing to the Lord knows what you're talking about. In fact, all we have to do is look back at the writings of Paul who says, what? why don't I do the things I'm supposed to do? And why do I keep doing the things I'm not supposed to do? Right? So we, we this isn't new. The, the new. human soul, the human spirit has frailties that date back to the beginning of creation. And uh, we're just kind of continuing it along. But I sure am uh, touched by your heart for this story and for the ministry aspect of it. Uh, again, the book is called You Ought to Do a Story About Me. We'll put the link to it in the podcast notes for those of you listening in podcast form. If you're listening on the radio, obviously you can go on to Amazon or wherever you like to get books and pick up a copy of this. Uh, you Ought to Do a Story About Me. And uh, Ted Jackson, I sure am glad that we had a return engagement on this program to follow up on the book. Now, now I just can't wait to get it in my own hands and read this thing from cover to cover because for the longest time since we first communicated, I, uh, I've been kind of keeping the plight of Ted and Jackie in the back of my mind. So I can't wait to read the full story of it all. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you for having me. And uh, thank you. Thank you for your interest in the story. It's, it's awesome.